Some opponents recommend to throw the idea of basic income in the dustbin of history. Is it worth to think further and more concretely about this idea? The most difficult problem seems to get from the system now to basic income. How could steps look like to implement such a scheme somewhere in the world? Well, you know, opponents of anything always want to see it in the dustbin of history and proponents of anything always want to see it as the next big thing. Um, I work I work mostly on the end of, of arguing for basic income on the philosophical level and showing that works on the economic level. Understanding the politics of how it gets passed um, is not my, my main area of expertise. There are, I can tell you what I think about it, but I can also point you to people who, uh, who know more about it, who study this a lot more. Uh, Yannick van der Borth is written a lot on, on that. And Richard Caputo in the United States uh, has, is just editing a book about basic income around the world and about the, uh, about the politics of it around the world. He's a good person to talk to. Also, Carol Pateman and uh, Matthew Murray are also doing a book on a similar topic. They're good to ask about the politics. Guy Standing also works, works on the politics. But what I think is that the idea is increasingly getting out there. People are seeing it as a realistic alternative. It's well thought out. It's on the shelf. If if we need something, that's an option. As long as it maintains as a realistic option, I think someone will want to try it sooner or later. And it crops up in strange times and strange places. Most people in Alaska did not realize that they were creating a basic income when they created it. They weren't connecting what they were doing with the big discussion of guaranteed income that had gone on in the United States about 10 years earlier. Most people did not make the connection that actually what we were talking about at the federal level at that time was what they were actually doing at the state level um, when they created the permanent fund. A few of them did. I'm sure a few knew that. I'm sure Jay Hammond, the governor who pushed it through, he knew. He knew exactly what he was doing, and that was part of what he wanted to do. Uh, now, uh, so it's cropped up there. Um, it's been, there's been a powerful grassroots movement for it in South Africa and in Namibia. The government has been resisting it in those countries, but a lot of people are for it, and I think that's a chance it'll happen someday. Um, there's a movement for it in Brazil, um, and it's, it's now, there's suddenly there's increasing interest in it in Germany and other German-speaking countries. Um, it, was, it was being talked about in Ireland for a while, and now it's not, but now it's on in Germany. So the idea keeps cropping up, and the, it's cropped up lately in the strangest place. The last place I would have expected is Iran. Iran has introduced a basic income. It's up and running, um, and it's... Uh, it's actually closer to the normal basic income model than the Alaska version is. And it happened in Iran as a political compromise. No one was really intending to create a basic income. They seem to have little or no knowledge of the big international discussion around basic income, but they had this huge inefficient subsidy system. They had this system where uh, they were subsidizing gasoline consumption, diesel consumption, heating oil consumption, and several other commodities with these hugely inefficient subsidies that reduced the price of diesel fuel to, I think, something like two cents per liter for a, for a, for a liter of diesel fuel, and you're paying like two cents. Um, and uh, for regular unleaded gasoline, it was like five cents, just ridiculously low. Um, and it was so costly to the government that all the money that they've gained from exporting oil over the last 20 or 30 years has gone to these subsidies. So the only benefit that Iranians have gotten from all the oil they've exported is the consumption of really cheap oil at home. Can't imagine a dumber use of your, of your oil revenue. But it was doing good for people because people got free, almost free gasoline consumption. 
and almost everybody used it and it benefited everybody. And so they couldn't just take it away from them and give them nothing. And so they were negotiating for years and years. They're going around, okay, we got to we got to get rid of these subsidies and we got to replace it with something else that benefits people on a broader as broad a level as gasoline subsidies did and they talked and they talked and, they, and finally what they came up with was basic income they reinvented basic income as a compromise to make it so everyone would benefit and there's it's a ran, so there's problems with it. Like they don't give the money to every single individual; they give it to the head of the household. They call the they designate the man as the head of the household, and he gets the money for everybody. So there's problems with it, but the poorest families who are citizens of Iran are benefiting, and the richest families are getting it too. And it, it's coming out every two months. People are getting it, and they're in. It's very small now, but they're supposedly increasing it over the time where it could be, um, I think it's forecast to become something like $1,000 per person, which is less, it's actually less than the Alaska Permanent Fund. But when you look at the difference in prices, how expensive it is to buy things in Iran versus Alaska, which is the, the most expensive state in the United States, it's actually, it is actually much it is actually, it will go much farther. It'll be, um, it will go much farther towards meeting people's basic needs in Iran. So it is actually much closer to the basic income platform. So it comes up there in this, what is really otherwise not a very sympathetic government, but, um, but comes up as a compromise and something that, that really is doing some good for the, the neediest Iranians. Unfortunately, it doesn't do anything for non-citizens. Uh, there are a lot of refugees living in Iran from uh, from Afghanistan and from Iraq, and none of them are benefiting from this. That's that's unfortunate, but um, but at least all the citizens down to the poorest level are benefiting from this. And uh, Mongolia is talking about introducing the uh, Alaska model. Um, it might happen there. So it keeps coming up, and it you need several things. You need you need a model to be in place. And that's why Alaska is so important. That's why I've edited these two books about Alaska, because people need to see that Alaska is a model that works and it's something we can imitate and adapt for use elsewhere. So you got a working model. People, people who support basic income didn't used to be able to say, look, here it's been tried, but now they can point to Alaska and soon they'll be able to point to Iran Hopefully, hopefully it'll work well in Iran um, and uh, and say, look, it's working there. You get more working models. That helps um, if you get if you get you can either have a people's movement or you can have a movement. Sometimes a movement just among politicians will do it um, in Alaska. There wasn't really a movement for it. They elected a governor who made it his top priority. It was the right man in the right place at the right time. Um, that can do it if they're in the if they've got a powerful enough office, um, or you can have a groundswell of people. If the groundswell of the people are strong enough, even if the government is reluctant, they can they can get it through. So you need some of those things in place, and uh, and I think that the movement for basic income is they're doing the right sorts of things, and they need to keep up. They need to keep up. There's experiments going on in India right now on basic income. And there's been a pilot project in Namibia. Um, all this increasing evidence showing that it works. Um, there's more and more things that people can point to. Also, cash benefits are being used around the world more and more. In, in, many, in many developing countries, they're finding that if they replace some of their in-kind benefits with straight ahead cash benefits that it's much better for people. Um, these benefits are conditional. It's going on. Mexico is doing it. Brazil is doing it. Many, many other countries are doing it, moving towards just simplified cash benefit. That's not creating a basic income, but it's moving toward a basic income. And one thing that people have been finding as they look at these, that these have the, the more effect they have on poverty is the higher the benefits and the fewer the conditions. 
That is, the more and more it is like a basic income, the better it is at reducing poverty in the third world. So we're gaining this kind of evidence. And a lot of countries, though they haven't adopted basic income then, have moved toward it. And I think that's a trend that is going to continue, especially in the developing world. So it might be the developing world that leads on this. Great. Very interesting what you were talking about. Thanks a lot for this interview. Oh, you're welcome.